Yeah. I mean, as we saw from that film, digital identification is a critical part of the digital infrastructure countries need to harness uh, for the transformative power of technology and AI. India is one of the world leaders in using technology to reimagine the state. And more than 1.2 billion uh, Indians have a digital ID, which, amongst other things, has transformed their financial system, already saving the government some $27 billion. Well, uh, Rajiv Chandrasekhar is the former Minister of State for Electronics, Information Technology, Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, and was a key architect of this transportation. Rajiv, come and join us. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. How are you? Good. So, you were an evangelist for this. I saw you quoted as saying you were an evangelist for this. Why? So, I've been around uh, tech for about three decades, and I think uh, the best part of these three decades, mo many of us in tech have spent talking about the potential of tech. And I think we are uh, at a time and a place now where it's become the promise and the reality of tech in terms of transforming economies, lives of people. And so, I like going out and talking about the power of tech, and not just the power of tech as a promise, but really in terms of what we've done in India, and how relevant it is for countries that have, for many, many years and decades, stayed outside and been excluded from progress and prosperity to embrace technology and, in a sense, leapfrog, as somebody said on one of the videos, leapfrog one whole generation of uh, not having opportunities or access to opportunities, but by using tech, actually do that leapfrog and uh, get to where they should be. So there's so much to talk about. I wonder whether we could first discuss mm -hmm. why a digital identity is so important for the transformation of a country. So l let me say this from our perspective. Obviously, there's a debate going on in the UK, and I don't uh, want to muddy the waters on that. Um, look, for us, the digital identity, which is uh, 1.2 billion Indians today who have it, is the bedrock and the core to a digital government architecture, uh, which has in many, many ways transformed the narrative of India, which used to be that this is a great country with a lot of good people, but had dysfunctional governance. And I, I, I'll give you a slightly longish response to this. Pre-2014, I used to go to many seminars in Asia, and it used to be told to me and repeated again and again that democracies in Asia could never deliver to their people. And that only authoritarian countries, and of course the example used was China, could deliver. And countries like India would always be these wannabes and has-beens. And it is after 2014 when we totally embraced technology, we transformed that entire narrative of dysfunctional governance. And there's an old quote from the mid-80s when uh, earlier Prime Minister of India said, when 100 rupees left Delhi for the people, only 15 rupees reached the people because of the leaky, sordid nature of governance. And technology, our approach to technology, our approach to digitizing government, transformed that completely. And you alluded to that, about $27 billion being saved. Over $350 billion of subsidies have been delivered using the digital ID as a, as a bedrock, as a core, with an overall digital government framework that we refer to as India DPI. And we have delivered government to citizen without leakage in the most responsive manner, unprecedented in the history of India, over $350 billion of subsidies and benefits. So just going back to the point you just made about the 100 rupees that becomes 15. Correct. The 100 rupees that goes out from New Delhi now. Is the 100 rupees that reaches uh, 70% of Indians who have bank accounts today, 80% of Indians who have bank accounts today, and just a decade ago, only 17% of Indians had bank accounts. So what has been the impact of that for government and for the people? Like I said, I think the most important impact is the fact that this narrative that democratic governments in Asia cannot deliver, that has been rewritten. In a sense, it's been turned on its head that we can be large, diverse democracy like India is, very noisy and all of that. If you think the UK is uh, noisy and 
and uh, uh, chaotic, you should come to India. So, but uh, <laughs> we have 1.4 billion Indians, uh, very diverse, very different aspirations, and everybody has recognized that this democracy can deliver and uh, people can expect a relationship with government that is based on trust, based on transparency, and based on responsiveness. And just, I, w I wonder, what was the technological challenge in rolling this out to 1.2 billion people across a vast country where often, say, transport infrastructure, you know, is not as kind of developed as it might be? Look, the, obviously for something like this, the most important infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure is the internet. So to get 1.2 billion Indians connected to the internet, that was the first challenge. I mean, we were in 2014, a decade ago, just under 150 million Indians who had access to the internet. And today we are at about 900 million Indians who are connected to the internet. And we will be 1.2 billion Indians by 2026. So getting them to connect and to have access to the internet was our first challenge. The second challenge is, of course, the normal conversation and noise that comes around anything that is disruptive and new, which is uh, to push back, saying, no, 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 we don't want this. This is going to uh, disrupt us in terms of data protection, privacy, and all of that usual uh, uh, the discussion and narrative, and we had to deal with that. And the third one was the issue that given India is so diverse and we still have a large poor population, digital literacy to actually get large numbers of Indians who are going to be connected to the government digitally to understand how to do it, to learn how to do it. And that was a big program that we ran for about five years and over 400 million Indians were skilled and trained in digital literacy. So. These were the challenges that we saw in 2015, and I'm uh, glad to report that uh, we could deal with those challenges and circumvent them. Well, uh, I, I'd be really interested to take those one by one, actually. Data protection. Yep. The argument is always made, and we've seen it, that you, know, you get a vast amount of data. There is always the danger that it can be hacked. We've had recent problem with our blood transfusion service in this country because of hacking of kind of data and all the rest of it. Yeah, so I will respectfully, I know there's a debate going on here again, but let me respectfully and with some authority and experience And say, sometimes disrespectfully yeah, yeah, as well. <laughs> yeah, well I, I try not to be, I'm a visitor, so I try not to be disrespectful. So, uh, look, I think this is a false binary that somehow privacy and digitization are contradictions. This, this is my opinion, humbly I suggest, is a fake, fake binary. That you can address issues of privacy the rights to privacy, data protection, as well as digitize by crafting principle-led guardrails that are embedded in law, which is exactly what we've done. We have a data protection law. We have created the guardrails that are required to protect an individual's right to privacy, individual's right to own his or her data, as well as accelerate and deeply embed the technology in government and governance. So I think people who say that somehow digital ID automatically implies a violation of personal information privacy, uh, have not read the, the last two chapters of the book that they've been reading. An infringement of civil liberties as well? Look, th this is an interesting debate to have, but I think if you, if you are open to a conversation, uh, India, the Indian example will show you that we are able to, for, ex for example, in India, data protection and privacy is a fundamental right. The, it's a constitutional right. So it's not just something that is legislated. It is a constitutional right. And we have had a data protection law passed by parliament that effectively manages to protect that fundamental right, the uh, fundamental right of the citizen, as well as continue to expand the innovation, continue to expand the digitization of our economy. So uh, I, I submit that this is not a contradiction. This is not a binary. And if you go down and deep, dig a little deep into this, you can figure out solutions that can do both. Protect the individual's rights to information privacy, as well as uh, grow an innovation ecosystem, a digitized, uh, re reimagined state uh, that can deliver better, more, be more responsive, and be more efficient. And how difficult was the job of achieving digital literacy? I mean, I, I would imagine among certain sections of the population, uh, elderly population who are unwilling to think, oh, I can't cope with this. Yeah, so I'm not the biggest fan of big tech, uh, but one of the things that the big tech has done for all democracies and especially open uh, societies 
is that they have managed to convince with YouTube and Facebook and WhatsApp, they have managed to help in the digital literacy uh, process. So there is already an organic process where people are learning, engaging, uh, embracing tech, led by these big tech platforms. We ran a very large program to cover rural India, rural, especially women, uh, to make sure that they were uh, embracing tech, they were uh, being educated on digital literacy, and they were downloading these apps and using these apps and connecting to the government in a manner that they should. And you know, today we have, uh, over the last 10 years, built 55 uh, million homes, of which 80% free homes for uh, poor people, and of which 80% of those homes are owned directly by women. So it, it is, there are many, many adjacent benefits to digitalization, which is empowerment, for example. When you talk empowerment, not in the abstract, real empowerment, real wealth creation, real asset creation for real people. Were there other political difficulties in delivering this that maybe you hadn't anticipated? Look, I think in, in democracies, and especially ones like in India, I think everything, every good intention has pushback. And uh, what we did is, for example, every step of the way on our uh, digital identity program and our data protection laws, we, ex we conducted extensive deep public consultations. We took the people along with it. So I think to say that there is no opposition to every, any good idea, despite it being a good idea, is wrong uh, in India. And it's certainly, the, I think, the case in the UK and other parts of the world as well. Yeah, and, we, and we, look, we heard from Tony a moment ago setting out the case of how transformative AI could be. Um, India has started on this journey. Do you think AI accelerates it? Look, I was listening to the two young ladies at the beginning, at the top of the show, Abby and Sasha, and I think uh, they said two things, and uh, they are absolutely true as far as AI is concerned. And one is that AI is the kinetic enabler of our economy. It's a, it's a fact, it, and anybody who lives in denial of it is, is doomed to fail. Uh, it is the next big thing. There's a book by Mustafa Suleiman from DeepMind uh, titled The Coming Wave, and it is certainly that. It is the coming wave. It's, it's going to be big. It is going to be transformational. It is going to require a lot of people to do a lot of adjustment. And at the same time, AI is also, as uh, Mr. Blair said, clearly the power to do more with less. You will be able to do a lot more as a government with AI with less resources than any government could do in the past. These two attributes of AI uh, and there's, you know, everybody is an expert in AI and everybody has many views on AI. Uh, but I, I like to focus on these two things about AI that cannot be ignored, must be embraced, and you have to figure out your own steady state as a government or as a people or a, as a business or as a community on which of those two parts or both those that you want to embrace and adapt to. And for countries lower down the income scale, does this technology offer a kind of, you know, a, a, an opportunity for economic growth that maybe wasn't there before? Oh, I think so. I, I think, uh, again, somebody mentioned that in the video there, and I, I repeat that. I think technology is the biggest leveler uh, in the recent years uh, of the disparity between the North and the South. The global South and the haves and the have-nots. Uh, the, the gap between these two uh, blocks of countries, if you want to call it that, is being leveled and equalized by technology in a manner that we haven't seen happen for decades in the world. And uh, today, uh, I was at the AI Safety Summit at Blitzley Park a few months ago, and it is clear that even the smallest of countries, whether they are in Africa, whether they are in South America or in Asia, they all aspire to the power of tech and the power of AI not just to improve governance, but to improve governance, create their own innovation ecosystem, create startups, be a participant in certainly shaping the future of the world as we all see it. I think So for the first time, regardless of the size of the country, um, you are potentially a player, if you want, if you have the political leadership to do that, in, in shaping the future of the economy and the future of tech. And is India working with other countries? In yes. The we, India stack? Yeah, so we've, we've taken our India stack, the India DPI, and offered it to 
the rest of the world, especially the smaller countries. Because for us, uh, as a government, uh, we think digital exclusion is the, should be the first victim, if you want to call it that, of this new phase of technology growth. We certainly want every country in the world, small, big, uh, emerging, not so emerging, developed, to all be, uh, to have access to the best technologies, open source technologies that we are building and, uh, and any other country is building. Yeah, and it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I suspect this is changing some of the sort of geopolitics, you know, around technology, with India playing an ever more prominent role. Yeah, I think, again, there are many people here who follow technology for many years. Uh, if you look back at the 10 years or beyond, beyond you, you see that tech was almost certainly uh, a small cabal of countries, if you want to call it that, that uh, sort of controlled tech. There were proprietary technologies, boxes that nobody really could penetrate, and they were the givers of tech. And most of the world were consumers of tech. And I think that is changing. Uh, a number of trends, AI, open source technologies, uh, the fact that softwareization of platforms is increasing and you don't really need uh, proprietary hardware as much. Uh, all of this is leading to uh, a realization, despite some northern neighbors of mine uh, wanting to control tech and the future of tech, that there is a huge opportunity for the democracies of the world to play this leadership role in shaping the future of tech. I mean, India, of course, we, we think we will play a role, uh, but it is not our case that we want to replace the US or we want to replace China. I think our case is that we think India, UK, US, and many other uh, democratic countries of the world can work in a good trusted partnership to create the te technologies of the future. It's so funny, the history of this country is about, you know, Britain led the industrial revolution around the world. And you kind of look at the technological re revolution that is unfolding right. before our eyes. And you kind of look to India now as one of the leading countries. So what should Britain be doing? What should Britain be doing in terms of spending, in terms of R&D, and all the rest of it, so that it is also a major player? OK, again, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I mean, my, my, my personal view on this is that I think UK uh, has, and I say this <laughs> at the risk of offending people, but has slipped uh, on the overall innovation ladder. And I'm not using any metric or any report. Uh, to say that. It, it's just my gut feel that you are being left behind. And I, I was at the Bletchley Park uh, AI Safety Summit, and it was quite clear that there are countries that were in a sense, banking on the weakness of some of the leading nations of the world in this area to take the leadership. And uh, I won't mention names of those countries, but you are aware of those countries. I think it's important that in this, for the next decade, this coming wave of tech, AI, UK, and especially democracies like the UK have to step up and play a leading role. I mean. Uh, I know the past was about geopolitics and we talked about security and all of that. I think as we look to the future of global trade, global digital protocols and uh, agreements, uh, it will be any country who is not relevant in that conversation is a country that is going to find themselves broadly relevant in, in terms of talking about the future of talking about the future economy. Rajiv. That was absolutely fascinating. And I think you, the final point you made there will have been appreciated uh, by this audience. Uh, Rajiv Chandrati, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank indeed. you. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much indeed.